Happy Derby, everybody. Are we ready? I think the countdown's to two days. It, it, runs, it runs together after about 100 for us. But it's wonder, wonderful to be with you here today. Uh, one reason I really encouraged uh, Charlie to keep the introduction short today is that uh, my wife works in this hotel, and it, anytime I get one of those introductions, her eyes roll automatically uh, <laughs> well back into her head. So, uh, so I didn't want to cause any physical harm, and uh, so, so, so he, uh, he kept it short for me. And I was encouraged by a couple of things um, uh, in, in the comments after I finally got here. I know, Char Charlie, are you okay, buddy? Charlie was a little nervous. He knows <laughs> chest pain, he said. Is there a doctor? Oh, he is a doctor. But uh, the, uh, uh, there are a couple of reasons he's concerned, actually. One is I'm always a photo finish to this event getting out of here. Uh, and, and another is that there was some suspense as to whether I would get here. Uh, was, Charlie gave me the annual call, and I said, Charlie, I'll be there, but there, there's one big possible curveball. And that is my, my oldest daughter, Heather Singleton, who uh, works with the Children's Hospital Foundation, is due to give birth today. <laughs> so, uh, so far, so good. There have been no tremors in the force. I, I did line up a backup speaker. We had somebody ready to go uh, just in case. But uh, I have now, I, I've given her a window throughout the week. Um, <laughs> I gave her Monday, Monday about 10 p.m. to about 2 a.m. was workable. Uh, I gave her a little room yesterday after the post draw, and uh, tonight uh, she can have the baby between 10 and 1.30 a.m. So, so <laughs> after that, she's got to wait till Sunday. So uh, that, that's good. You know, I know that looking at the calendar and doing math in the, in the beginning of the baby-making process, that's really not part of the discussion generally, but from here on out, we're putting a big blackout zone on the calendar in her house and for, and for my other two daughters in years to come. Just do the math, you know, and, and, and think about dad in the first weekend in May. So, um, and I expect them to pay attention, just as much attention to that as anything else I've told them in the, in the last 30 years. But it makes, it's an exciting week anyway. It's made it a little bit more exciting. Uh, this year's Derby, when I, I, I go back, uh, I read derby history all the time, but every year I try to find some some theme that uh, that uh, that is appropriate for each year's derby. And, and this year was pretty easy. I started looking back and and looking at previous derbies and, and what what they might offer for this derby. And I, and I discovered that uh, that years that end in three are pretty remarkable in the history of the Kentucky Derby. It starts out in 1913, a hundred years ago. This is the centennial of the victory by the longest shot in the history of the Kentucky Derby, Donnerail. 91 to 1, he paid in 1913. It's a, a Louisville jockey, Louisville born jockey, Roscoe Goose, was aboard this horse. And uh, Roscoe was later a very successful <laughs> businessman. The extra uh, Earl Ruby, a career journal writer, uh, wrote a book about him called The Golden Goose. They called him The Golden Goose after his riding career was over. And, and also, I just actually just discovered this year, he had a brother, Carl Gans. They were an immigrant family, and he, he took Goose, the brother took Gans. But Carl won the Kentucky Oaks the day before. Only brother tandem ever to do that. So that was a pretty remarkable derby. And it was remarkable, too, to show you how times have changed because uh, that derby day, 1913, uh, the source was stabled at Douglas Park. Anybody, you, you guys know where Douglas Park was? Out in the south end, off South Side Drive, uh, behind uh, the old Holy Rosary Academy location. There are actually two big brick posts that stand right next to what is now Americana Community Center out there. And, and th that was the actual entrance to Douglas Park. That's all that's left of the racetrack. But the track was actually in existence from the teens through the mid-50s. Finally, a fire closed it down in the 50s. But it only raced a few years. But Donnerail was, uh, was training there in 1913. And Roscoe showed up at the barn that morning with the uh, trainer and, and the owner. And they pulled Donnerail out of the stall. And then they walked him to Churchill Downs that day. <laughs> he won the Kentucky Derby. And they walked him back home that <laughs> night. So uh, the celebration is a little higher. The stakes are a little higher now. But that was actually a very important derby. It started a string of three straight derbies that were incredibly, incredibly critical in making the Derby and Churchill Downs into what they are today. Donnerail made national headlines at 91 to 1. Big long shots always do. A horse named uh, Old Rosebud came to town the next year. He was already, you got to remember the time, in the teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, even into the 50s, I guess, uh, the three major sports covered in American newspapers were baseball, boxing, and thoroughbred racing. Not in that particular order. So these race horses were huge national stars. Old Rosebud was a champion, came to town. He won the Derby by eight lengths. He set a track record in 1914. Then in 1915, regret, a three-year-old filly came to town and beat the daylights out of the boys. And that made true national headlines. And that three-year arc really helped put the Derby where it is today. And it all started with Donna Rail 100 years ago today. 
of this derby. 1933, another notable derby because uh, the two jockeys in that race, their names were Herb Mead, uh, excuse me, uh, Don Mead and Herb Fisher, coming down the stretch aboard two horses, one named Broker's Tip, the other named Head Play. Horses were, were doing battle, you know, eye to eye coming down the stretch. The jockeys were literally doing battle. They were fighting each other. They were slapping each other with whips, grabbing each other's silks. They were grabbing tack. It's called the fighting finish. It's one of the most famous derbies of all time. And it was won by uh, Fisher aboard Broker's Tip. He won by a nose. At least we think he won by a nose. There was no photo finish that in those days. And they had to, uh, had to have the judges decide. And we had a, a chief steward and four assistant stewards. And all the history I've read indicates that the assistant stewards believe that head play won the derby, but the chief steward said, no, Broker's Tip won the derby. So Broker's Tip gets the nod. His only win in 14 career starts. And the two jockeys did not talk again for 32 years. So that derby literally went on for three decades. With the fighting finish in 33 is another important one. 43, we had a triple crown winner, Count Fleet. Won the derby easily, ridden by a guy named Johnny Longdon. Johnny Longdon is the only man ever to ride and train a Kentucky Derby winner. He rode the Triple Crown winner, uh, Count Fleet. He came back in 1969 to saddle a horse named Majestic Prince, an unbeaten horse, to win the Kentucky Derby. So that was 43. He also, in winning the Belmont Stakes, he won the Belmont Stakes by a, a total of 21 lengths. Very, very impressive for Count Fleet. That was 43. I'm going to come back to 53. 53 is one of my favorite derbies, but uh, we'll talk about that one a little later. Let's jump on up to 73. That was? Secretariat. I don't know if you've given this much thought, but I'm going to say this. It's been 40 years since Secretary had won the Kentucky Derby. That might be troublesome for some of us because that's, that's a lot of time and there's too many of us in this room that remember everything about it. But yeah, 40 years since Secretary had won the Derby. Uh, of course, went on to become the first Triple Crown winner in 25 years. Citation from Calumet Farm had been the previous one in 1948. And I remember reading as a kid growing up, people said there will never be another Triple Crown winner. And then Secretary had won it. His track record in the Derby went from last to first to win. The Preakness, my personal favorite, he went from last to first on the first turn and won and set a track record. His jockey, Ronnie Turcott, told me once, he said, uh, Big Red just said it was time to go. So we went on the first turn and led the rest of the way and beat his rival, Sham. And of course, won the Belmont Stakes by 31 lengths, erasing Count Fleet's record, another one set in one of those three years, and carved four seconds off the world record for a mile and a half. I don't know that he was the best horse that ever lived. I don't know that he was the best horse of the 20th century. I do know for five weeks nobody's ever been better than this horse was in winning the Triple Crown in 1973. Uh, move ahead a bit. I'll jump ahead to 2003 just because I think that's a great year for us. That was the year Funnyside won the Kentucky Derby. He is at our racetrack today. He's going to be in our paddock during the fifth race. Sunnyside, Funnyside's important, I think, because he is great proof, and there are many other stories through the years, but he is great proof that the Derby is an achievable dream. I mean, here was this horse. He was a New York bred gelding. Uh, there were none of those in the Derby record book before he came. He was owned by a bunch of high school buddies that called themselves Sacatoga Stable. They were from upstate New York. They loved the uh, Saratoga race course, and they were uh, from Sackett's Harbor, New York. Six of them got together at a Memorial Day picnic. They shared a few too many beers that day and decided it's a good idea. Let's get in the horse business. So they all, they all wrote $5,000 checks, $30,000 outlay. Remember that $30,000, $30,000 outlay. They bought a claiming horse and had some luck with him. Then they bought another claiming horse. and. Had luck with him, they had a little money to spend, so they decided to buy a young horse. Uh, they got together, that first meeting where they, they made the pledge to get in the business, 1995. By 2003, they were in the Kentucky Derby with Funnyside, who was, again, a little New York bred. They bought him for 75,000. Uh, he uh, had run well, he dominated the New York bred horses in the fall of his two-year-old year, but, uh, and he ran well enough, they thought, we, we've got to try the big boys. We've got to try the Derby horses and see if we fit. He ran three preps before the Derby, didn't win any of them, but he ran well enough, especially in the Wood Memorial, where he was beaten by a neck by the Derby favorite Empire Maker. And they came on to Louisville. And uh, they, he came in late in the week, and I'll never forget seeing Jack Knowlton, the managing partner of, uh, of Sacatoga Stables. I saw him on, it was actually this morning during that Derby week in 2003. I see this guy walking down through the barns. He's the only guy wearing a three-piece suit in the, on the entire premises in the morning out there. Now I saw him two days later wearing the same three-piece suit. I don't think he'd ever been to bed the whole time he was here. And they won the Kentucky Derby. They, they showed up for the Derby that day, not in a limousine. They showed up in a rented yellow school bus. These ten, then at that point, ten buddies in Sacatoga Stable, and they won the Derby. 
And in doing so, they beat a horse named Empire Maker, who was the favorite and a horse that if you were going to build a derby winner, it would have been him. He was the son of a derby champion and bridled. The mare had produced grade one winner after grade one winner. She was one of the great mares of the 20th century, owned by a Saudi prince, so he wanted for nothing. And uh, he trained by a Hall of Famer in the late Bobby Frankel, ridden by a Hall of Famer in Jerry Bailey, but none of that was good enough to beat Funny Side in the Kentucky Derby. He had come up with a little foot problem a couple of weeks before the race, slowed his training a bit. And I'm telling you, probably every other day of his life, he was a better horse than Funny Side. But it's not being the best horse overall. It's being the best horse on the day that makes the Kentucky Derby. It's one opportunity, two minutes on a Saturday afternoon in May, the first Saturday afternoon in May. Three-year-olds only. You don't get another chance. You get no do-overs. You have the opportunity. You've got to be poised and ready. You've got to make the most of it. And that day, Funny Side did. Two horses met again five weeks later, and in between the two meetings, between Funny Side and Empire Maker, Funny Side had won the Preakness by nearly 10 lengths, and people were talking triple, triple crown. But when he met again with Empire Maker in the Belmont Stakes, it was a muddy day, and Empire Maker showed him who was the boss overall. He beat him that day by about seven lengths. But on Derby Day, there's only one of those, and it belonged to Funny Side. And a bunch of guys who had a dream, they didn't dream of being in the Derby. They just wanted to have a nice horse and have some fun. And then they had the ultimate fun on 2003. So that's one of the three years that's my favorite, just because it shows everything is possible and the door is open and available to everybody because you cannot make a $30,000 initial investment as a group or a $5,000 individual investment and win a Super Bowl or a World Series or, or a NASCAR race. It doesn't happen, but it can happen in thoroughbred racing. And, uh, and again, those years in three have been pretty remarkable. This year's got the potential. We've got a lot of nice horses, no super standout going into it. A uh, horse has really gotten a lot of talk in the last few days and will be the Derby favorite is Orb. He drew nicely in the post draw yesterday for Shug McGahee, who's a Lexington-born trainer. He used to train at Churchill Downs many years ago before he went to New York to train for the Phipps family, one of the great families in thoroughbred racing. This family has always wanted to win the Kentucky Derby. They don't come here frivolously. Uh, their best shots to win the Derby. They had three great horses in the 20th century. They had a horse named Round Table happened to, uh, but not round table, pardon me, but Bold Ruler happened to catch the toughest derby field of all time in 1957. He finished fourth that day. He'd be better known later on. He was a champion, but was better known later on as the sire of Secretariat. They had another horse named Buck Passer in the 60s who was injured in the Bluegrass Stakes, didn't make it to the derby. And then they had a great horse in 1989 named uh, Easy Goer who raced twice at Churchill Downs. He didn't like mud. He specifically didn't like the Churchill Downs mud and he found mud both times he came to Churchill. He was beaten by his rival Sunday Silence in 1989. And uh, so that's, uh, Shug's been back a couple of times, but not with a serious shot, but he is really feeling good about this horse, and he should. He's won four in a row coming in, got everything you want to see in a derby winner, and he's the favorite going in. The second choice in the morning line is an unbeaten horse named Verrazano, trained by Todd Pletcher, who has five horses in this Kentucky Derby. Fletcher throws a lot of horse at, it, at, at the Derby, but he's, a, he's, an, he's an incredible trainer, a wonderful talent, has a long, long roster of, uh, of uh, well, uh, well-moneyed clients that get some good pedigrees in his hands, but you still got to get them there. 27,000 horses started out in this crop, and there are a lot of them that never came close to getting here. He's got five of them in there. Four of them, I think, have legitimate shots, but Verrazano is kind of the glamour boy of his group. Has never really been breathed on in his four starts. I think some people think me, he may be suspected a mile and a quarter. I don't know. He hasn't been tested. He will be tested Saturday, that much I know. And he will have to break one long-standing derby rule, and that is handicappers and longtime derby fans feel that you have to race as a two-year-old to win the Kentucky Derby. You've got to have that foundation underneath you. It's worked every year since 1882 when a horse named Apollo won the Kentucky Derby without having a start at two. He made his debut at three. But it's worked every year since then, and now Verrazano comes in with four career starts. And if you'll recall that horses celebrate a communal birthday on the first day of the year, on New Year's Day. Every horse, uh, for the purposes of racing, turns a year older. That's the official birthday of these horses. And the first start for Verrazano in his career was New Year's Day. He's won four in a row since then. He officially did not race at two. So he'll try to smash uh, more than a, a century of history, uh, a century of history in, in winning this Kentucky Derby. And, uh, but he's got high quality and, and again, a great barn. Uh, the other horses that line up immediately behind him, Calvin Burrell, who's won three of the last five Kentucky Derbies, picked up a nice late, late, late mount named Revolutionary. He's also trained by Pletcher. It's the same combo that won the Derby, that rainy Derby back in 2010, the Super Saver one. You remember when the sun came out just as the, just as the call to the post was blowing? It's that group back here again with Revolutionary, who's in. I've told you guys before, I think, that these horses, if you look at them in terms of humans, they're kind of like teenagers, early college uh, 
early college athletes, uh, you know, the body's still coming together. They're, they're, they're really, you know, the muscle musculature is forming. They're, the maturity is coming along. Sometimes the brain is not quite there. Um, and again, father of teenagers, the brain is the last thing to arrive many times. It, it's not unlike that in horses. Uh, and, and revolutionary tends to get himself in a little trouble. He lollygags a little bit. And sometimes when he's coming down the stretch, he kind of jumps around. He looks like your dog does when he comes to, when he sees you at the door for the first time at the end of the day. You know, he's jumping around, hey, let's go, let's go for a walk. He's, he's kind of like, he, you look at him and he looks a little goofy sometimes. He's got all kinds of talent. And I think it's a perfect union of jockey and horse. Uh, Calvin Burrell, <laughs> not that Calvin's goofy, you're misinterpreting, wait until I get through my point. Oh, Calvin is just the coolest customer ever. I mean, nothing scares him. Uh, and, uh, and he sits there and waits, and he patiently waits for things to happen. And, and I think he'll get this horse out of the gate a little quickly. And I think he'll probably get the same kind of trip that Super Saver got. If he's laying fifth or sixth, and he's not getting muddy, if it, if it does indeed rain on Derby Day, and, and, and again, most of you know I'm a Chamber of Commerce guy, always sunny in 75 at Churchill Downs. But it, that can be challenged sometimes. Uh, should it, especially should it be wet. I think he's going to be sitting in a good spot, and Calvin will be sitting there waiting to to make the move, and he might be the right horse in the right spot. Uh, some other major players, horse named Normandy Invasion. Uh, uh, his owner, uh, Rick Porter, is a history buff, and he, he, is a, he is a, especially admires the veterans of the D-Day Invasion. Actually, he's bringing about four or five of those D-Day vets in to see the horse tomorrow at Churchill Downs. But uh, this horse only only one, one win and five starts, but he's a wonderfully talented horse and just kind of coming around. And, He's got a shot to pick up some horses in the home stretch. And then a horse that will get probably more betting action than he would under any other circumstances is, is a horse owned by a guy, uh, you may know him, his name is Patino. Uh, Rick Patino ha owns 5% of Golden Sense. With Rick Patino's year, it's tough to go against this horse. I mean, uh, uh, Golden Sense comes off a win in the Santa Anita Derby. He's one of the major contenders for this race. He's got a running style that should fit the race. He's trained by Doug O'Neill who won last year's Kentucky Derby with, with I'll Have Another. Uh, but, but again, I want you to think of what Rick has accomplished this spring. He wins a national championship in basketball. He goes into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Even the, the, it even goes to his son. Son Richard gets a job at the University of Minnesota after doing an incredible job down at Florida International. I saw his team. I'm a Western Kentucky guy. I saw his teams, and the guy can flat out coach. Then on the weekend that his team is earning its way into the Final Four, he wins the Santa Anita Derby with Golden Sense. It becomes one of the top four. Well, he's actually going to be the fourth choice for the Kentucky Derby. And uh, so, so he wins that day. The horse is wearing number five, which is Kevin Ware's number, and meant something in the spring. And if he had drawn post position number five last night, I would have thrown away every scrap of paper I've got. <laughs> and I would have just said, this is Rick's year. Why even run it? But, uh, but, but it, you know, at least he's not in number five. Although, I must say, Mike Battaglia did make him. Five to one in the morning line. So, so if Rick gets it done, you you think of the odds against that happening. I mean, first of all, could there ever be a greater Kentucky trifecta? National Basketball Championship, Hall of Fame in basketball, winning the Kentucky Derby. Anything I could ever say to you, I am no more certain of than this statement. It'll never happen again. <laughs> this is the one possibility it could happen. It's unbelievable. And if it does happen, it will be the worst day in the history of the University of Kentucky. I do know this. <laughs> I am confident of that as well. I am, I am confident we may have to put guards on some bridges if that happens uh, Saturday night. But, but the horse does have a chance. And again, who, who could, who could bet, bet against him right now? Then uh, you, know, you look for good stories in the Derby. And one of my personal favorites is D. Wayne Lucas. Uh, Wayne Lucas has two horses in this race. Wayne's been around the Derby since the, the early 80s. And he's changed the sport came into the business, uh, treated, he, was also, he was a great horseman, but also treated it as a, as a real business. He came in, he, he carefully manicured the barns, and you know, uh, a lot of times if you've ever been, ever been into a racing barn, they, they have the tack room, sometimes you'll just throw a desk, or sometimes you just throw in a trunk there and you work off a trunk, you know, but Wayne's offices always look like you're walking into the CEO's office. They always had wood paneled walls and, and winning pictures on the walls. Wayne brought a new image to thoroughbred racing and a new way of doing things. Uh, Wayne can also spend a little money. Uh, his, one of his great clients, Gene Klein, who used to own the uh, San Diego Chargers, they won the Derby in 88 with the Philly winning colors all those years ago. And, and, uh, and Gene said the next year, he said, I gave Wayne an unlimited budget, and he exceeded it within a year. So Wayne, <laughs> Wayne <laughs> the image does not come cheaply, but you get results with Wayne Lucas. And, and he's got two horses in this Kentucky Derby. One is Oxbow, who's owned by Calumet Farm. Let me say the name again, Calumet Farm the greatest name in the history of the Kentucky Derby. Calumet owned and bred, well, owned eight Derby winners. They bred 
nine of them. The last one was uh, strike the gold back in the early 90s. Calumet has gone through changes in recent years, now has a new owner. Same farm over in Lexington, but the new owner, and that is Brad Kelly, one of the most amazing Kentucky success stories you'll ever see. A Franklin tobacco farmer who bought a bunch of discount tobacco brands from British American Tobacco. And then he built a, a cigarette company in Bowling Green called Commonwealth Brands. During that time, he made a ton of money. He brought a lot of Churchill Downs stock. He once owned 24% of the stock at Churchill Downs. He uh, sat on the board of directors, and to my knowledge, anyone I've ever questioned, during his years on the Churchill Downs Board of Directors, he never uttered a single sentence or syllable at any meeting the time he was there. He, he got out of, the, uh, out of Churchill Downs, sold his discount tobacco brands for a billion dollars, with a B. Again, this is a Franklin tobacco farmer who spent about two semesters at Western Kentucky. And uh, clearly, those were the turning point of his life. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Western guy. And even a short, even a short connection with that school puts you there. But now, go home and Google him. His last name is K E L L E Y. You'll find he's one of the largest landowners in the world, one of the richest men in the world. And Calumet is one of his projects. And he's here with a horse named Oxbow that has really suffered from some pilot error in his last three races. And if he gets a good ride, I think you'll hear his uh, name called throughout this race. He's ridden by Gary Stevens, the great jockey who's won three derbies, two with Wayne. And uh, uh, Gary's come out of seven years of retirement to get back in the saddle. He's going to try to win another Kentucky Derby. If Wayne wins this Derby, he is 77 years old and a force of nature. If you come out to the track, he shows up at the track every day at 430. He's on the saddle aboard the pony at 6, aboard, the saddle, aboard that pony watching horses for the entire morning. And, uh, and uh, the, the surest bet you could possibly have during Derby Week is to drag Wayne around to bars and have people guess how old he is. Again, he's 77. You wouldn't guess him for a day, even over 63 or 64. Just amazing, incredibly energetic, uh, incredibly enthusiastic. Uh, you know, he, he's so confident and, and so lively that, you know, there's several women in the room here, he would make a pass at you, I'm pretty confident. So he's very, he's a very optimistic man as well. So, uh, <laughs> but he's a great trainer first and foremost. And he's got this horse with Calumet, and he also has a horse named Will Take Charge, and both are capable. Two note before I get to uh, wrap things up, two more bids for history in this Kentucky Derby. And one is another piece of magic associated with Golden Sense. His jockey is a guy named Kevin Krigger. Uh, Kevin Krigger, if he wins this race, he's, uh, he was uh, born in the uh, U.S. Uh, Virgin Islands. He is uh, an African-American and would be the first African-American to win the Kentucky Derby since Hall of Famer Jimmy Wingfield in 1902. African-American jockeys dominated the Derby in the early years. Isaac Murphy, one of the early Derby winners, was the Michael Jordan of his era, and Jimmy Winkfield was one of those two. But again, their chances basically evaporated. Blame Jim Crow laws, blame racism, but they were shoved out of racing like African-Americans were shoved out of many areas of American life. And, and now Kevin's got a chance to reconnect with the early history of the Kentucky Derby and become the first in uh, well over a century, first African-American rider to win the race. And then there's my loot who's ridden by Rosie Napravnik, who made history last year by becoming the first woman to win the Kentucky Oaks. She is the sixth woman to ride in the Kentucky Derby. She was aboard the inelegantly named Pants on Fire last year and finished ninth, the best finish of the six women who have won, who have ridden in the Kentucky Derby. And it hasn't been a groundswell, it hasn't been a flood of women in the saddle since Diane Crump became the first back in 1971 to try it. But, uh, but she's here and she's got a chance to better that finish last year and who knows, when that, the, when that gate opens, as I've told you many times before, it's the most democratic with a small d sports event in the world. And uh, when the gate opens, anything can happen. And Rosie's got a big shot to, to get it done on Derby Day. Those are just some of the stories. If you're looking for a couple of long shots that could run well, one of the Pletcher horses, Palace Malice, I think is poised for a big race. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, as I said, Ox Oxbow's going to be 30, 40 to 1. I think he's got a big chance to win for Lucas. Uh, there's a horse named Frack Daddy that's trained by uh, – Ken McPeak, Lexington native, a horse that's doing really well, hasn't won any of his races this year, but had some hard luck, had a foot injury earlier in the year. He ran very well at Churchill last year. And if you're looking for a true bomber, remember this being the 100th anniversary of, of Donna Rail's victory at 91 to 1. There's a horse named Golden Soul that is trained by Dallas Stewart. He's going to be in the neighborhood of 90 to 1. I personally think it'll be 70, 75 to 1. But a lot of those 20 horses, when they turn for home, they're going to be looking for a gas station. It's a long way home at a mile and a quarter. And he's going to be passing some horses down the lane. I think he's a real long shot with the possibility. Oaks race, I hate to spend so little time on it. I believe the Oaks, are, the Oaks Phillies are better than the boys. This is an incredible group. Might be, we, we won't know until you know, a few months down the road, but I think it's the best group of Oaks Phillies I've ever seen. Uh, the, uh, and I've been there, this is 32 years of derbies for me. I've never seen a group quite like this. Uh, Dreaming of Julie is the favorite. She won her last race by 21 lengths. Ran the same day that Orb won the Florida Derby. Ran two seconds faster 
than Orb did on the same racetrack. That's 10 lengths difference. Now, that race came out of nowhere. I don't know if she can do it again. If she can do it again, she'll win the Oaks. But if you have doubts, Bob Baffert's got a great look affiliate named Midnight Lucky. She's gray, which will make her an odds-on favorite for a lot of people. Still, the question I get every year is, who is the gray horse? That's the one you need to bet this year, Midnight Lucky in the Oaks. Bill Mott's got a filly I think will be a great price named Close Hatches. Uh, but it's just a wonderful, wonderful field of fillies. And, uh, and I like uh, Midnight Lucky and Bob Baffert to win his third Kentucky Oaks. But for the Derby, I have to make a choice. I was very, I was very uh, f first of all, relieved to hear that you're going to have speech competition next week, because that means I won't be called back to explain what went wrong <laughs> this year. So I, I'll have a year to work on that again. Uh, but I've really gone back and forth, and I've, I've settled on revolutionary uh, for this year's Kentucky Derby. Again, I think if he gets out of the gate well, and it's always a big if, Grell will have him in the great spot. And he is, there's nobody more confident, nobody with more courage. And all these guys have courage, but Calvin just sits there. He takes him down on the inside. Imagine what it feels like to be not only trying to guide a 1,200-pound animal, but then trusting the 18 other, 19 other 1,200-pound animals to run in a straight line. But Calvin never has a doubt. And uh, I just think it's a perfect marriage of, uh, of, of horse and human. So I, I like Revolutionary to win it. Uh, I like Bo Orb is the horse to beat, no question. I think that if anybody beside Orb wins the Kentucky Derby, they'll either have to pass him late or they'll have to hold him off. He's going to be a part of it. Uh, I think there's no question on that. And he's ridden uh, by Joel Rosario, who won five races on opening night at Churchill Downs and has been the hottest jockey in the country this year. I like Oxbow to get a piece of it. I think he's going to run well. I think or Normandy Invasion is going to run well. And for those long shots, Frack Daddy and and, uh, and Golden Soul are, are the horses for me. But I like Revolutionary in this race. He's got a wonderful pedigree. He's got the man in the saddle. He's trained by, trained by Todd Pletcher. They won it in 2010. And in a year ending in three, he drew post position number three. And the numbers are, are OK this time of year. Quick note about that one other derby, the 53 derby. I like to talk about that one because it, again, shows how difficult this is to win. The favorite that year was a horse named Native Dancer. Racing's first TV star, one of the great, one of the top 10 horses by anyone's count in the entire 20th century. Unbeaten coming into the Derby, heavy favorite, gets out of the gate pretty well, a little bit slow, but he, but he gathers himself down the lane under Eric Guerin, everything's going all right. Till they head into the first turn, always a danger spot, all the horses kind of come together, it's the end part of the accordion. They're all looking to save some ground, and he gets slammed by a horse named Money Broker, drops straight back, loses several lengths in a race in which an inch can mean everything. Down the back stretch, he's looking for, uh, looking for holes. It's like your worst day on the Waterson Expressway. And I'm talking the old Waterson Expressway, the thin one that had ramps this long. It's that kind of day. Everywhere he goes, it's just a disaster. Finally gets loose on the far turn, starts running. He's got one horse to catch coming down the lane. That's a horse named Dark Star. He's flying at him. Dark Star's at 16 to 1 out there. Native dancers gaining with every stride. And, and, he, and he, it looks like he's going to blow on by, but the wire comes up just a little bit too soon. And, Dark Star wins by a head. Native Dancer raced 22 times in his career, and he won 21 of those. The only one he didn't win was the one that mattered most, and he was owned by Alfred Vanderbilt. Yes, one of those Vanderbilts. Think about advantages. Had all the uh, best pedigrees you could possibly have, the greatest trainers, the greatest jockeys, all the money in the world to support uh, a, a sport that he loved. And Mr. Vanderbilt was in his 40s in 1953. And I'm confident that he was just crushed on that day, because this was the greatest horse he'd ever had. But he would have other great horses. And I'm sure he thought he'd win a Kentucky Derby, but he only did not win one in the next 45 years. He never got back to one. That's how tough it is. Native Dancer's trainer said they shouldn't run a race that Native Dancer can't win. But we do, and it's called the Kentucky Derby. And we'll see what happens on Saturday. Quick note about last year's race. You'll remember just in, in terms of last year's race says, in terms of history, we had an historic Kentucky Oaks, not just because Rosie and Napravnik and Believe You Can won, but because we had a little weathered situation and we evacuated the infield for the first time in 138 years for the Derby or the Oaks. And it was an interesting exercise, and the fans were unbelievably great. I mean, uh, you can't imagine how cooperative those guys uh, were, especially after drinking that many beers for that many hours. But they were out of the infield, and all ran well. We got lucky. The weather went short, but the weather went south, and we got everybody out, and we ran the Derby, uh, the Oaks about an hour late. But one of my favorite things about that day, and whenever I write the book, it'll, this story will be in the book. I didn't see it, but one of our police officers who helped us in, uh, in security did. He's up on top of the track after the, the, the infield's been evacuated. He's looking through the infield, making sure everything's okay. We're waiting for the storm to come. And as he's going through the infield and he's making his run, he, he goes past some porta potties and he sees the door slowly open. <laughs> From the porta potty emerges a man, a beer in hand. 
It's clear. Well, let's say the things we don't know. We don't know how long he'd been in there. <laughs> we don't know what he'd been doing. Had he been sleeping, playing words with friends, <laughs> handicapping, I don't know. But it was clear by his body English when he pushed that door open and he stepped out, beer in hand, that when he stepped into the porta potty, there were 50,000 people in the <laughs> entry. When he stepped out, it was him and his beer. And so he steps out and he does this number. He's just. <laughs> like, where the hell did they go? Uh, or some variation. And I, I don't know what he thought. I, I, you know, I, I don't know if he thought it was the greatest effort. Uh, the great, uh, he'd gone into a great uh, episode of The Twilight Zone. I don't, I don't know if he thought he'd been punked. I, I, I don't know if he thought the rapture had occurred. Although, although if that had occurred, I'm telling you, there'd have been a few other folks left in the infield. I'm guessing. I, I know that crowd. But, but whatever happened, uh, he, it, it was just a, just a magical, magical moment. I would love to talk to that guy. It's just an image I'll never forget. So uh, it's going to be nice this weekend. It's always sunny and 75 at Churchill Downs. I hope this guy comes back. I hope he stays with us through the, uh, the entire two days. But, but uh, you never know what's going to happen at Churchill Downs in the infield or anywhere else on Oaks and Derby Day. But I know it's going to be something wonderful, and I'm never more assured of that than looking at those derbies that have ended in years, in the years that have ended in the number three. It's been remarkable for a century, and I don't expect it to stop this weekend. You guys have a wonderful derby. I hope you come see us. And uh, I can't wait to come back next year with a tale of, uh, I'm sure, some wonderful childbirth story from Derby Day uh, sometime in the <laughs> afternoon. Or, or just to keep Charlie in shape. That's the main thing I'm here for, is just to keep the blood pumping. But uh, it's always a highlight to be here during Derby Week. I really appreciate it. It's part of the Derby uh, tradition for me. So thanks so much, and I can't say anything better than happy Derby. Thank you.